All right. Just call my friend Lewis again, and we're just finishing up doing part two of our video where we are tracking through some hands he's played in the last week or so. Um, you know, it's going to be another video. It uh, takes place at 25 and 50 cents, no limit. If you guys haven't checked out uh, the first video in this two-part little series here, you should check that one out first. Um, you know, in case we refer back to any of the hands, because we just talked about it a few seconds ago, but uh, I'm not sure when the release for these videos is going to be. So, um, with that, any further ado, here we go, me and Lewis making another video. So, let's kick it. All right. We get uh, some dude limps in the somewhere, and it looks like the. Uh, under the gun. Um, do you have any reads on this guy before we get going? Yeah. Okay, so this dude, uh, double A, mod T, uh, only 32 hands, but he's playing 19-3. Interesting, okay. With a 3.0 aggression factor. And uh, this dude in the small blind who cold calls my button raise, uh, 41 hands, is playing 78 with a aggression factor less than 1. Oh, okay. So, right. So two guys that are not experts is what we're looking at here. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say the uh, VPIP was at the small blind? Uh, 70. Right, so pretty high. Okay, so we get a, a favorable flop, one would say. Um, and then you get bet into right away. So what's your read now when, when he bets into you on a board like this? Okay, so I'm pretty much immediately, like thinking flush draw okay I like I like that read uh, frankly I think that especially like his small bet sizing makes me think right. even more that he's got the flush draw like if he had top pair like why is he not betting like six or seven into this like pretty wet flop with two players like yeah totally and I think this is a, f a funny spot too because it's like I think the bet sizing, you're absolutely right, gives gives a huge amount of information because I find that small bets generally mean small made hands or flush draws or just general draws, you know? Yeah. Um, something that wants to see the next street cheaply. So um, when I put an opponent on a range like that, my tendency is just to play it really fast. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when I have a big draw like this, because the thing is, you know, with, with a small draw, like even if you had like let's say jack nine of spades, I think a raise becomes a lot less good because, um, you know, it, it's just really hard for you to have him in a dominated position. Right. Um, but with the ace-king, it's just so likely. Like, if he has a flush draw, he just basically needs to have the ten, exactly, ten X of spades to have you in bad shape. Otherwise, you just have him, like, morally crushed. Yeah, yeah, totally. And... Uh, see, I just I just got greedy, cause like I knew this dude in the small blind was like just so bad. So I was like, right, my right. plan was to call to just like try and string him along, and just like gotcha. get you know his money in addition to like this other guy's money. Right. See, the issue there though is that you're getting that dude. Like, if he has a queen, he's not going anywhere. You know. Yeah. Um, if he has a ten, even it's not likely that he goes there. And I think the biggest thing that I'm concerned about is I don't want to just like close up the action. I really want to give that first guy an opportunity to reopen the betting, you know? Yeah. Um, and by calling, yeah, you'll invite this guy in for a couple bucks here and there, but um, really the big money is getting it in, draw over draw, like just like that. Or even, let's say he doesn't get it in with his draw, let's say he just calls. Um, now, you know, you guys might both make your draws, or he might have that 10, like we talked about, and then he just goes ahead and check folds the turn, and you don't even need to make your hand, you know? Mm -hmm, definitely. Because the problem with calling the flop, too, is that, you know, there are a ton of cards that come on the turn that you don't really don't like to see, um, and that your opponent could keep betting, and now it, it's starting to get a little bit sticky as far as your odds, and you don't really know where you're at. Um, you know, like a 9 comes on the turn, he bets... You call the river, like, pairs the four or something, and he checks. Like, you just don't know if you're good. You don't know if you need to bluff. Like, I think that uh, playing it fast just gets him to fold hands. Um, and, you know, 19 type three, a 19-3 guy, he might fold queen-jack if he calls the flop and you bet big on the turn, you know. Yeah. Um, 
So I think in that spot, <coughs> I think I'm I'm usually just finding a raise, you know. Yeah. <coughs> and I play draws a lot slower than most most uh, most high stakes players, but. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts on all that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. And, like, normally my default would be to play this fast. But, you know, like I was just saying, like, I, right. well, I mean, no matter what both of these guys have right now, like, mm -hmm. my equity is just, like, smashing them. Right. And so I, th I just thought that, like, if I called, you know, I could, like, string the small blind along and then... And, you know, that uh, just, uh, I mean, I'm just, like, talking in a negative tone right now, which is, like, bad for the discussion of this <laughs> hand, but, like, right. you know, uh, I mean, basically, my thought was, you know, I want to call and string the small blind along, just continue to, like, get more money in the pot, and then, right. like, you know, I don't think, I think if this guy at Double uh, A Mod T is, like, betting, like, if he hits his flush, like, I don't see him being capable of getting away from it. No, definitely not. I mean, we're not we're not worried about that. The, the issue, though, is that um, if our read, like, if he turns his cards face up and he's got 8-9 of spades, you know, um, right. we're, we're not especially likely to make our flush anymore, because there's two of our spades are, at, are gone. You know right, I mean? right. So... Like when you, it'd be one thing if you knew for a fact he had like Jack Ten, um, then luring another player in starts to sort of like make more sense. But um, like for instance, if we know for a fact Seagun has pocket fives, it hurts our equity to keep him in the pot. You know, right. because um, we rate to win the pot unimproved if we are just heads up against the other dude, whereas um, whereas Seagun is just ahead of us, you know. I mean, I guess, I mean, we have the, uh, well, we have the gutter, too, so it's, it's actually pretty close, even with two dead spades, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, like, let's say he has jack-10 or something like that, we're thrilled if he leaves the pot, I'm pretty sure. I, I would have to look at it, but either way, it, it's just close. So I guess my point more is that, like, even if you are, quote-unquote, luring his money in from a hand he wouldn't call if you raise, like, let's say 8-9, mm -hmm. um, those times where he wouldn't call your raise but would call if you just called. I think they're so small. Because, like, let's face it, if he has, like, king three or something, he's just folding, you know, <laughs> um, basically no matter how bad he is. Yeah. So I think that from that perspective, I think that raising, you're not really driving out too many of the hands that would call anyway. I don't know. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, like, yeah. I mean, he, he's, there are definitely times to sucker people in. Like, if you had pocket tens here, you know, I think you could call. Yeah. Um. But uh, but you're just drawing. Like your hand's just really not that good yet. So, um, I think winning the pot on improved would would still be a, a favorable outcome for you. Yeah, so, agree. So, but let's see how it plays out. So you call, see, so get obliges by coming along. And now the five of clubs comes off in the turn, which is which is a fairly interesting card. And now our guy bets, all just a little less than a third of the pot. So, yeah. so now we're basically just sure he has some nonsense, right? Like. You know, King Jack, Jack Nine, some small flush draw, right? Yeah, yeah. I'd say that's spot on. Like, you know, what he's showing up with in this spot. Because I don't even think he can keep pounding away with like King Ten, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know how you how you can when you have two guys calling behind you here. Yeah. So, I, I think given that information, it, well, now it's kind of funny because. Now Seagun, if he has a pair already, is for sure ahead of us. So Right, yeah. So now probably <laughs> well, now probably we're just calling to draw anyway. But we go back to the point point that if the guy betting doesn't have a pair already, we're still leaving a ton of equity on the table by by only calling if he has yeah. lower spades, you know. Yep. And now Seagun's money is, is basically irrelevant compared to the uh, initial better there. Right. So the river comes, Club City, and it's checked to you, which is kind of kind of interesting. Yeah. So now, well, I mean, like obviously, this is like the worst situation ever. But uh, so I mean, I'll tell. I mean, I can just like tell you what's going through my head at this point. Um, you know, 
a, a couple of hands ago, like on a different table, I had played a similar kind of hand where a guy had been like donking into me and I had position. Um, and there was, you know, two of the same suit on the flop and it didn't come in and he checked the river and I bet and he folded. Okay. So I've kind of got that, you know, I'm kind of like thinking about that and, uh, you know, I think I can credibly represent like a top pair hand if I bet out some kind of, you know, quote unquote value sized bet. Yeah, I agree with that. So when he checks to me, you know, I'm like, I'm going to represent that I've got like ace queen here and, you know, fire one out. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, I think you could represent king, queen, queen, jack, a lot, a lot of stuff. I mean, you could also, definitely not another question for you to have clubs. The big issue with bluffing this river is that the pot's protected by Seagun. Right. Like he's calling if he has a pair, no matter what. Yeah. So he's getting nine to one. So, <laughs> I mean, even if he's not thinking in those terms, he sees it's five more dollars. There's 45 in the pot. He's just, he's calling for sure. So right. that sort of changes the dynamic of the pot, would make me lean away toward, from bluffing. Um, but certainly if this were heads up, or if it's definitely if like Seagun were a little bit better of a player and he had like $30 back, um, I think putting a big bet in here would be excellent. So, yeah. Um, so it looks like, yeah, you fire 22. Seagun actually folds. Could Seagun have had, who knows what he had. He must have had spades too somehow. Um, <laughs> and then you get called by the, the preflop guy and he shows you seven, six of spades. So apparently he just can literally see right through your soul. Yeah, he, he really can, yeah. And it's just, it's just so gross that like, come the turn, I'm just absolutely destroying him. Well, forget about the turn, the flop. Yeah, the, the murder. Oh, yeah, he got no out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, like he, he, he thought about it, and like he time he had like twenty seconds in his time bank, and time down to like three seconds, and then and then called it, and I was just like, wow. Well, well see, the funny thing is, it's not. Yeah, it's not even a bad call from him on the river because the thing is, like, given that you didn't put any action in on the flop, you it is sort of tough for you. Like, you can't have aces or kings, you know? So then he's putting you on a pretty narrow range, you know? Like, a misdraw or, or a, you know, I guess, like, a, a medium but not great queen. So, um, it's kind of funny. Although, uh, to be honest, if I was in his perspective and you bet with that guy in a small blind with $5 left, I don't think I could have found a call with 7-6. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a funny hand. I think it's sort of, it sort of speaks to... A concept which I like to talk about a lot, which is the fact that there are boards, you know, of all the available plays in poker, there are boards where those plays are most appropriate and boards where those plays are least appropriate. Um, and as far as raising your draws, I think this is a very, very appropriate board to do so. Yeah. Um, and as far as like just calling with your draw, you know, for me, I'm I'm like I like to call with draws for two reasons, and, and I really I'm not sure that there are really more reasons than this to do it. I think that you basically want to call with your draws. Number one, if you're not going to be thrilled with getting your draw all in at whatever street you're on, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have, if you don't feel like your fold equity outweighs the chance that you're going to wind up having to call all in, so. Um, you know, certainly this isn't one of those cases. Like, we're not, we, we wouldn't want to, we're not necessarily, we're, we'd be thrilled, actually, to get it all in on this flop. Um, you know, whereas the reverse, if we had seven, six of spades and a guy bet into us on the button, you can make a much bigger case for calling just because it, we almost never have our opponent dominated at all. Right. So we're effectively never getting the money in good, and we're just hoping he folds or we catch up. Um, on the flip side, a time where I really do love to call also is like if I have some disguised outs. So like let's say I call the flop with seven six of spades and I turn that five of clubs, mm -hmm. giving me an open ended straight. Um, that's a time where I often will call because um, you know even though I have more outs, I also have six more outs that I'm that are so disguised. Like he's never going to put me on the three when it comes off. You know. Yeah, totally. Um, so those are spots where I like to just call and 
and sort of and sort of just keep it going. So yeah. Um, overall, is is it a huge crisis not to to raise this flop given that you had a poor player in small blind? I wouldn't say so, but I think definitely in a vacuum. If I read against small bets is that he has a ten or a flush draw, then I think racing really has to be the play. Yeah, agree. So I, I I'd like that hand though. I think it definitely um it definitely shows us a lot of good concepts. So yeah. Oh. Is that all the hands I had? <laughs> um, I don't think so. No, certainly. Maybe we were skipping around a bit, but... Yeah, I must have closed them. Um, okay. I'll just pull this one up. All right, so... Here, we are dealt King-10 offsuit. And... Let's see what happens. 22. You jack it up on the button, which I definitely like. Um, and you get called in two spots, so... Do you have those reads available? Uh, uh, I just need a quick second. Sure, sure. Can I see? Okay, so uh, Falk Dog and Southeast Poker Prez. Okay, uh, Falk Dog is playing 1613 with an aggression factor over 10 after 106 hands. Okay. And uh, the Prez is playing 3017 2.3. Over 237 hands. Okay. So Falk Dog is, is aggressive. Very aggressive, yeah. Okay. Um, Alright, so let's see what happens. So you see about the flop, which is pretty standard. Now this is very interesting. Um, well, now what's, what, what sort of range do you put him on when he check raises a flop like this into a field of two players after you see about? Yeah, so... <sighs> See, this is like this is like really tough because you know the like the range I'm putting him on here is like okay. So we know that he's like generally tight. So like what the question is like what is he flatting like my ISO raise from the button with? Like mm -hmm. it's got. I mean, you know, he's only playing sixteen thirteen, but that's not to say that like. He couldn't be flatting like a little wider than normal. So like, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we can put like, you know, Ace Ten, King Ten, maybe Queen Ten and Jack Ten. Um, some middle pocket pairs, sets of threes or twos. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It's mathematically unlikely that he's got a set of tens, but I mean, and then you know, a whole smattering of air. Yeah, and that, and that's the the really the, the the interesting part about this hand to me is that when he raises a okay, so first of all, your c bet doesn't exactly scream strength because you're betting three seventy five into seven. So, yeah. Um, so right away, if, if he's a very aggressive and observant player. You know, if I made a C bet like this and got raised out of the small line, also because let's say he had a set of threes, what does he need to raise it right now for? You know, yeah, that, like, it's so true. Like, it doesn't make any I sense. It, the board like being this dry is just gonna like blow me right off it. It literally makes no sense at all, and he can't have two pair. Um, and not to mention that there's really there's only seven combos of available sets out there, whereas there are literally infinite combos of air. And given the fact that he's so aggressive, right now, at this point in the hand, I'm like licking my chops because I'm thinking that he basically can't have a hand. I mean, I, I don't think he would play this fast, you know, with, with a made hand. And if he would, good for him. But this is just not a play I see, you know, generally, generally, you know, regular players making with with a big hand. Once again, unless there's some major history, which it doesn't seem like there is really. really. No, yeah, definitely not. So I'm assuming that we call the flop bet for sure. Yeah. And then so the eight offsuit comes on the turn. Um, and from my perspective, nothing's changed. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I like yes, I I agree with you. I don't think anything really has changed. Okay. So, he bets 14, which is a pretty small bet. Ah, and your cards went away. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, like, I, th I think I did spend some time, like, trying to decide what to do here, and I think, 
Uh, like I, my, I mean, I think what I was thinking at the time was that like, I, I don't know, you're right. Like he's just too aggressive for me to be like laying this down. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably, that's just probably right. I, I think what I really like to do here a lot of times is just like snap call on the turn, um, just to, and this is what I do against observant players because there's a very common idea that's out there that um, that if you call quickly you have a weak hand because you didn't consider raising obviously. Right. Um, and so I love to employ that when I plan on calling down, and it really it really does work because like if you just snap call that turn bet, you're basically announcing that you don't have like a set or anything like that. You weren't even considering any other action besides calling, yeah. and then your hand just like you're just you're really saying that you have like an underpair of the 10 or maybe like a weak 10, something like that. And he's thinking he's going to be able to represent, you know, such and such a scare card on the river, you know. Yep. And given the fact, you know, he bets small. I guess he's setting up a river bet, I guess, theoretically, if he actually had a hand. Really the only hand I could see him being ahead of us here is pocket eights, you know. Um, and so, I, I mean... Yeah, that, that's really it. I, I, I'm just having, unless he's playing in a very unorthodox way, and just raising it right away with the pocket threes or something. Like yeah, maybe like an ace ten or something. I mean, ace ten is like the only hand I think. That he, but even still, what's he hoping to get called by? Like, I just don't get it. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, so. that's just, it's just weak. It's weak by me. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, maybe Falk Dog will eventually watch this video and let you know he actually. <laughs> Turn the eight or something and yeah. failed you out. <laughs> so yeah, it was actually a soul penetrating read by me in retrospect. Totally, totally. Um, <laughs> I don't think this is the right hand. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now we have some queen jack, and uh, I, if I remember, I, I don't think reads are too necessary on this hand. Okay. This, this was actually just a super small concept I wanted to to point out. It's nothing too too major. Um, basically, just your standard limped pot. Um, you know, open ended straight draw, and a small bet goes in. So this is like a mandatory call. Obviously, there's that's no secret. Um, the ten is a moderately interesting card. Possible that people have a full house now. Um, bigger concern now is that one of your straight cards might make someone a full house, which would just be a huge disaster. Yeah. Um, but still, I mean, he bets 150. It's it's still it's just tough to get away from a 150 bet, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, 5 to 1 right there. I mean, I'm just... Yeah, you call. And if the big blind, you know, goes all in or something, then you can fold. But Yeah. Um, I, I think that you're just getting laid too good a price. Uh, just immediate odds, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, to make your hand implied odds be damned. And now here is the spot where I just didn't... I, I didn't like your action on the river here. Um, and that's just because at this point, I'm basically certain no one has a 10, because everyone's just betting so small. And you, you checked, and I guess it was to go for a check raise. Yes. But see, the issue with the check raise is, from my perspective... I, I'm not putting Sash Reb on a 10 at all. I mean, he bet the flop, but then he bet so small on the turn that it looked like he was actually scared of the 10. Um, so the problem is, even if he does elect a value bet, I, at this point I'm putting him squarely on a king, you know, um, mm -hmm. or a, or just a bluff, but he would have to be pretty awful to uh, have a bluff there. But either way, I'm not putting him on a 10. So if I'm not putting him on a 10 here, I don't think I can check because even if he does bet, he's almost certainly not going to call a raise unless he's, like, the worst player in the world, I guess. Um, but on the flip side, if he is really bad, I can do something like just, like, lead pot here, you know? Um, lead $8. And, and am I going to get a call? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But the fact is that at least I'm giving my opponent the opportunity to call. Yeah. Um, and I, I think just checking here, you're just going to get it checked through way more, and you're never going to get two bets anyway, so I would just try to do do my best job of getting one bet in. Yeah. And I, other th and I also think that if 
These guys are pretty short. I think that they would raise if they had a 10, and you bet the river anyway, so. Yeah, true. Yeah, so I mean, so you Those think that, my considerations. Yeah, so I, um, so yeah, so just to ask, though, like, do you think that bet size of like around pot or, um, like you know, eight to ten bucks on this on this river is like a good size to be going for here? Sure, yeah, seven, eight, something like that. I mean, w when I'm dealing with bad opponents, which I have to assume Sash Reb is. I'm not fretting bets. I don't think he's folding for 10 but calling for 8, you know. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll fiddle around with it a little more when I'm dealing with, like, actual opponents who know what they're doing. But yeah. um, with bad opponents, I'm just going to I'm just gonna put the money out there and just collect for the most part. Because I, I, I can't imagine that this guy's just folding a king all of a sudden, you know. Right. Um, he might, but uh, from his perspective... He's like aware that the nine made a straight, but he's not necessarily folding anyway. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, both of these guys are pretty terrible. Right. Well, yeah. The uh, so. um, yeah, Sashrab is playing a fifty-three sixteen after forty-six, and Bima's twenty-two uh, seven after twenty-seven. So. Yeah, not standard. No, That's not what we call them. Yeah. So um. So this is the last hand we're going to look at. Uh, and I thought this was a really interesting one. Um, it's at that same table. I don't hate your open queen jack. It's, it's a little loose, you know, in in middle position there. But um, I don't mind it. I mean, you have two awful players behind you, so yep. what's the worst that can happen? Unless the blinds are, are particularly squeezy, they like a lot of three bets, then, then I think I like it. So. Mm -hmm. You get a call from a dude named Sir Langdon. And he checks it to you on the flop. And and what's your thought here? What sort of c betting range do you like? You know, I mean, like, are you how often I should say are you c betting a flop like this against um, a standard big blind in these games? Um, I have to say that. Or did you have stats that were specific to this guy? Yes. Yeah, so uh, just. For the record, uh, after 33 hands, this guy was playing 31-3. Oh, the big blind. Yes, sir. Sir, Senor Langdon or whatever. <laughs> C Wait, senior. I think I had a different read for his. Senior, senior Langdon, Sir Langdon. Oh, uh, I was thinking Sir Langdon, but he might be Senor Langdon. You might, <laughs> you might have that right. But yeah, he, he's rocking the 31-3. I mean, the sample size is not huge, but. Sure, yeah. So I'm I'm thinking... You, you don't really need a huge sample size. If you manage to play any quantity of hands at 31, <laughs> I'm happy to play poker with you. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, you know, what, like, while this may be, like, hitting... So, I mean, like, it, it's more than reasonable to suggest that he's got at least one pair in a spot like this. Mm -hmm. um, right, and even for a loose player, it's fairly tough to have two pair on this board, you know. Yeah. Um, so I should say I, I like your bet, you know. I, I think this is a spot where it's very tempting to check it back. Um, but I think t to justify checking this back, like I think you're way better off checking this back in a 10-20 game than at a 25 and 50 cents game because very few players will really put you to the test. Like, from his perspective, if he's calling in the big blind, he needs to be check-raising flops like this, like, all the time, you know? Right. Um, but I think it's, he's probably the type of guy that if he has king three of hearts, he's just checking and folding, him, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think that's going to be the situation, like, more often than not. And Yeah, absolutely. I'm and gonna... I mention that there, there are cards that can come that you can keep firing on, too. So. For sure. So he goes ahead and, uh, Calls her, calls her bluff, so to speak. Yeah. He checks the turn, and the turn is an interesting card, also. Um, yeah, because like everything know, just I'm got there. I'm not happy there. with that turn. Yeah, I'm not happy with that turn from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I I agree. Um, but at the same time, like I have to think that his turn check is like so weak. I mean. 
That's true. Like, you know, e- just everything that's right there, you know? And, like, he decides to check again. Well, I'll say this. I think that a guy like this, if he has, like, 7-5, I don't think he bets it out on the turn all the time. Um, I certainly think that his turn check means he does not have a flush, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to... You know, this is a kind of this is the kind of situation where I'm gonna be like double barreling when you're check calling a flop and then checking this turn to me. Okay, yeah, I, I can get down with that, and I think that you know there will be occasional guys like this who know how to check raise, but they're gonna like check min raise you on the turn, and you can just get away anyway. So. Exactly, yeah. Now I will say though that if the river comes off like an eight or a six, or like pairs the seven or something like that. I'm, I think I'm done with the hand at that point. Yeah. Um, but um, so you bet six and he calls, and then we make a pair on the river. <laughs> that we do. So that's a really really interesting card. Um, I, I think the river actually has a lot of a lot of intrigue. Um, I mean, how often do you think you're ahead now? Um, I would say very rarely, to be Really? Honest. So you think he has to have a club? I think he likely has some kind of pair and maybe, like, small club. Okay. See, I think for me, I think that's part of his range. Um, but for me, I would be thinking, I'm ahead now. If I made that queen on the river, um, or I, I should say it this way, I'm thinking two things. Either I'm ahead, or if he checks, I'm going to go all in. Because I, what I don't want to do on a river like this is bet like 15. Um, because I think I'm just making him fold hands that I'm ahead of anyway. And I think that he's probably calling anyway with like the 8 of clubs, um, or the 10 of clubs, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I think if I go all in, he's definitely not calling with the 8 of clubs. you know. Right. Um, and I think it's pretty darn hard for him to have the ace of clubs. Unless he happen to have exactly like... Ace nine with eight of club, ace of clubs, or ace seven with ace of clubs. Right. Yeah. Right. Totally. So I think if if it's me in this pot, I'm pr- I'm I'm typically checking back, um, or or going all in. I think both of those are actually fine, and I think they both have the same result. Actually, you know, I take it back. I think maybe going all in is better because I think it's so hard for him to have one of the top two clubs, and a guy who plays thirty one three is going to be goofy. But I don't think he's going to be calling off his whole stack with uh with less than the nut club. Right. And so I think your idea is, is good here on the river, but I, I don't I don't know if I love the bet size. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um so what happens? He just dumps it. Yep. So yeah, I mean like I, I agree with you about the you know, the bet sizing, but yeah, I mean I think I yeah, I just I just I think he is always, I mean, I guess, you know, you, you just said this, like, he's always checking, like, this river with his, like, medium strength clubs, or, like, medium or lower clubs, and, you know, in, in my opinion, he's got that type of, like, he has that type of holding, like, fairly often, and after, like, I've already bet the flop and turn, I think it's a, just, like, a mandatory river bet to push him off of it. Well, see, I think that if, if it were the king of clubs, not betting would be a disaster. But I think the fact that you just made a pair, because consider also the fact that um, the five puts out a lot of new draws on the turn. So if he has, like, pocket sixes with no club, he's still calling the turn, you know? Yeah. Um, and same thing with, like, seven, eight of hearts or, like, all, all that other stuff. And it's not... I, I agree with you that a club is somewhat likely, and I, I think that if we were drawing the um, like a line, I think betting is better. Going all in is better than checking, um, but I think I like checking better than a small. I guess I, I th- your bet is still pretty big. I, I think that like the worst thing you could do on this river would be to, like bet ten because yeah, you're, you're never getting a call from worse, and you're always 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 getting called by any club. Yeah, so, um, the bet definitely needs to be big in this spot. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think even like a full pot makes an impression on people sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I, I will maintain. I mean, given the fact that he folded, I, I would, I would very, very strongly lean towards the fact that he had like pocket sixes or, 
or seven six or something. But um, yeah. you know, who knows? But um, but either way, I, I think this was definitely a, a good hand. It, it's it can be tough to know when to turn your made hands into bluffs, and I think that that's something um, you know, maybe in the next week or so when you're marking hands, we can we can take a look at because that's something that if you're going to be a good player, you definitely have to be aware of when you need to turn your made hands into a bluff. You know. Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, but I think that'll that will wrap it up. Um, cool. Yeah, I think we we got a lot of good hands, and uh, thanks for donating them. <laughs>